Dr. Jack Bright was having the second worst day of his life, and things weren't about to get any better. He ran down the main hall of Site-19, medallion jangling against his chest. All around him, sirens blared and warning lights flashed a stark, threatening red. He cursed and muttered under his breath. Just an hour ago, things had been under control, neat and orderly, standard running operations. And now they were staring down the barrel of both a broken masquerade scenario and a potential XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. And on a more personal level, four of the meanest, nastiest, and deadliest anomalies were on his tail. They breached containment, compromised site security, and now they were out for revenge. What was happening? How had this group of anomalies gotten out? And why were they all after Dr. Bright? And most importantly of all, how could everything have gone to hell in a handbasket so fast? Let's rewind the clock and see. The morning had begun in the break room. Dr. Bright was enjoying a nice cup of hot coffee and a Danish watching the news. It was, by all accounts, an incredibly boring day. The reports were economic figures, a few dry statistics about unemployment, and then live coverage of a presidential press conference on the White House lawn. Dr. Bright was halfway through a thought about how he'd hated his brief period of time inhabiting the body of George W. Bush and running the country when the president started melting over his podium on live TV, as well as his guards, and the press corps, and the camera people. It was a sight so shocking it made Dr. Bright drop his coffee cup and almost drop his Danish. He slipped out his phone and fired off a text to 05-1, the leader of the 05 Council, simply saying, we may have a problem to which he received the quick and emphatic reply, "Ya think? Dr. Bright started frantically changing the channel. He wanted to know if some anomalous troublemaker had just melted the president and those around him, perhaps to destabilize the US government. That'd be a textbook chaos insurgency move, or if they were looking at something considerably more dangerous. And considering every single channel Dr. Bright changed to started displaying a signal interrupted message, now was probably not the time to be optimistic. It was here, the big one, the one they'd all been waiting for. Battle stations, engage. Across Site-19, the protocols were enacted to put everything on total lockdown. Nobody in, nobody out. It was lucky for everyone inside that hadn't already been exposed that this protocol also involved the automatic shuttering of every single window in the building. Dr. Bright and a crack team of senior researchers and administrators gathered in the site's command center and opened up a live video link to 05-1. They might make some sense of all this chaos now and figure out a good battle plan. So, what's the situation, boss? Dr. Bright asked. 05-1 let out a deep, rattling sigh. <sighs> well, Jack, things are about as bad as they'd ever been, so I'll try my best to take inventory. A quarter of the council is gone. They got exposed and stopped reporting in during the initial shift. That includes 05-9 on the orbiting base, given she probably got the most direct exposure. A senior administrator raised their hand and asked, eh, Exposure to what, sir? 05-1 took a grave pause before saying, Sunlight. That seems to be what we're up against here. The one common denominator that seems to connect everyone experiencing these anomalous effects is direct sunlight exposure. It causes people to take on a kind of gelatinous state. And it isn't just people either. It's all living anomalies too. Something about this new sun thing. It's almost like it cancels out all previous anomalous effects. The only anomalies that seem to be exempt are the ones who aren't even made out of flesh. Dr. Bright, who had a tendency to make jokes as an emotional defense mechanism when things got tough, chimed in with, On a semi-related note, anyone here feel like taking the lizard for a walk? The few nervous chuckles in the room were cut off by 05-1 slamming his fist against the table over the video link. Everyone fell into a deathly silence. Damn it, Jack, this is no laughing matter. The Foundation and the rest of the human race is decimated right now. We're looking at billions dead already, or at least changed. And even our people, a good portion of them, are reading the tea leaves and abandoning their posts to spend what could be their last hours with their families. It is imperative we take control of this situation right now. It may be our last chance. So get your asses in gear and make it happen. And with that, the video link was cut off. And the ragtag leaders of Site-19 got to work. Taking what they knew about this lethal new scenario, 
Dr. Bright had his subordinates record and release one of the most significant videos of the 21st century, or perhaps even all of time, to be broadcasted on every communication channel the Foundation could possibly hijack. TV, radio, social media, YouTube, Twitch, all global news outlets. The SCP Foundation was going public. People all over the world huddled in the dark, terrified of the horrors they'd seen through windows or out of the safety of shady corners, noticed that all the screens around them started playing the same thing in perfect synchronicity. It was flashing red with an unfamiliar logo, while a commanding voice droned on with the only instructions that might give them hope for survival. This is a public service announcement from the SCP Foundation. We are commandeering all broadcast channels and frequencies to deliver a vital message. Avoid sunlight at all costs, cover your bodies thoroughly, and follow the instructions on the screen to reach the nearest operational SCP Foundation containment site. Back at Site-19, Dr. Bright and everyone they had left were preparing for a sudden influx of refugees from the outside. Any members of D-Class personnel who weren't psychopathic killers were deputized as honorary Foundation personnel and brought in to convert empty wings into sleeping and living areas. Bright, who was still trying to hold on to some semblance of humor in this dark time, thought to himself, well, if I knew we were going to be entertaining guests, I would have cleaned up the place a little more. You know, maybe bought some new throw pillows and a scented candle or two. And make no mistake, it was indeed an incredibly dark time. It had only been a few hours since the phenomenon started, and already it was hell out there. Society had already effectively collapsed during the chaos. The streets were filled with the shambling remains of melted nightmare people. The sun shone far above like some all-powerful tyrant, gazing its single deadly eye down on all of humanity. For billions upon billions of years, it had given this solar system life. Now, all it had for them was death and destruction. For those trapped outside, there was only one hope of survival, getting to one of these SCP Foundation containment sites. At least those people somehow knew what was going on here. Little did these unfortunate refugees of a horribly and irreparably changed world know that all was not well in the world of the SCP Foundation. As the hours marched on, broken masquerade scenario and possible XK aside, it seemed to Dr. Bright that they actually had a handle on the situation all things considered. And what's more, the night was about to fall, allowing for free movement outside. This would be a boon for people hoping to reach Site-19 with minimal risk of exposure. But refugees wouldn't be the only thing coming to Site-19 that day. Hours earlier and miles away, something terrible happened at Containment Area 25B, an extensive and heavily guarded containment site with only one inmate. During the initial panic of the event that they were now codenaming When Day Breaks, many of the guards were exposed and several others abandoned their posts in panic, knowing that the world as they had all grown to know it had come to an end. This left the place grievously underguarded. 200 meters under the sea, in the true heart of the containment area, an obsidian coffin was surrounded by a confused and terrified skeleton crew. And the term skeleton crew was about to take on a far more literal meaning, as the obsidian coffin they were trying in vain to keep contained started to rattle. Fast forward by 20 minutes and every single member of Foundation personnel at Containment Area 25B was dead, and SCP-076-2, the legendary immortal warrior Abel, was standing in the ruins of the base. While it would be easy to write Abel off as a mindless killing machine because of the sheer ferocity he brings to a battle, the reality couldn't be further from the case. He had the kind of tactical intelligence that human supercomputers wouldn't develop for another several centuries if the world hadn't ended already. From the visual evidence he'd gleaned upon escaping, he already knew that sunlight had turned deadly, turning everyone who was exposed into these feeble blobs. So if he hoped to continue his killing frenzy elsewhere, he'd need to create his own shade during transit. That would be simple enough. With a cruel smirk, Abel picked up one of the reinforced blast doors he'd so easily burst through earlier. The sheer weight of it would have crushed a mortal man, but for Abel, this was little more than a light workout. He lifted the door above his head like a parasol, 
bathing himself in the cool shade before taking off at impossible speeds. He'd remembered a lot from his days under the Foundation's employ as part of the disastrous Pandora's Box Mobile Task Force, and one of those things was the location of Site-19. There'd be plenty of warriors for him to send to their makers there. Back at Site-19, where Abel would very shortly arrive, Dr. Bright and his team were helping the first wave of outsiders into the confines of the building. At first, it had seemed like a good idea, something they could sustain. But now, Dr. Bright was starting to worry about all the practical considerations. How would they keep potentially thousands or even tens of thousands of people fed, clothed, and watered for an extended period of time? Sure, they had the infinite pizza box, but pizza for three meals a day for weeks on end was a fast track to everyone here dying of scurvy. These new worries were interrupted by a siren that signaled familiar ones. There had been a containment breach in several cells in the humanoid containment wings. Some of the low-risk or even friendly humanoids, like SCP-343, aka God, had been let out to assist in gathering survivors from the nighttime chaos outside. That meant anyone still locked up really, really, really needed to stay locked up. In other words, it was very bad news. Dr. Bright cursed under his breath and instructed his subordinates to keep focusing on the refugee situation. He shouldered an assault rifle and took off into the bowels of the site, hoping he could at least head off the escapees until some guards or mobile task forces from smaller sites could reach Site-19 and help him in getting them fully recontained. Oh, this is just typical, he thought to himself. When it rains, it pours. We can never catch a break around here, can we? I should have followed my dreams and become a competitive ice dancer, then I never would have. Dr. Bright's self-pity was interrupted by a brutal punch to the side of his head, which laid him out against the wall. He turned, vision swimming, and raised his assault rifle, hoping to find a target in the blur. That's when an obsidian blade swung at impossible speed and cleaved his gun in half. He could feel his breath hitch in his throat as his vision recentered itself, and he saw the imposing tattooed figure of Abel standing above him, wielding one of his trademark swords. His dark eyes were burning with deadly intent. Hello, Jack, he said. Long time no see. I imagine I don't need to remind you who I am. Abel laughed, and Dr. Bright felt his muscles tense in rage. Of course he knew Abel. Not only had the homicidal maniac been a consistent thorn in the Foundation's side since day one, but he'd also been the one to change Dr. Bright's life forever. It had been Abel who had killed him as a junior researcher when he was first carrying the SCP-963 medallion. It was Abel who had cursed him with this terrible immortality. Dr. Bright despised him to his core. I'd like you to meet a few friends I made since I got here, Jack. Abel said, gesturing into the darkness of the hallway. Who said I was bad at teamwork? It was like something out of a nightmare. First, SCP-106 stepped forward, dripping with that terrible black tar. His face twisted into a manic grin that foretold inhuman tortures to come. Then came SCP-953, the devilish polymorphic humanoid, claws and fangs bared, tails swaying, and then, bafflingly, SCP-2430, the immortal Hitler clone. Dr. Bright tried to move, but found the tip of Abel's sword right in front of his face. It's funny, Jack, Abel said. You are an anomaly who kills to live. How many people have worn your little necklace, and yet you can swan around as you please while we rot away in containment? We think it's time for a little payback. Bright nodded. That makes sense, I guess, but why is he here? He pointed to the immortal Hitler clone, who sneered as usual. He thinks you're Jewish, said the polymorphic humanoid in Korean. Clearly, that wasn't Korean, but here we are. Dr. Bright rose uneasily to his feet, honestly surprised that Abel was allowing him to do so. He was lucky in a sense. It perhaps took a being as strong as Abel to hold these others at bay. As much as Dr. Bright despised the man, he offered a much quicker and more painless death than the old man or the polymorphic humanoid. It wouldn't be anything he hadn't experienced before, after all. Life could be a sick joke sometimes. So, what's the plan? You're gonna kill me again? Dr. Bright asked. The four nightmarish anomalies all began to laugh. <laughs> well, in the end, yes, Abel said. But the world's gone to hell. You people aren't in control here anymore, so we can take our time. 
we will slaughter you and everyone else in here. If I were you, I'd run, Jack. He didn't need to be told twice. Jack ran for his life, too scared to even look behind him as the sound of footsteps got louder. The only way things could possibly get worse is if he somehow, amidst all this, suddenly developed a hernia. And the way this day was going, he really wouldn't have been surprised. Dr. Bright turned a corner and somehow the polymorphic humanoid was already there, standing in front of him. She gave a girlish giggle and swiped at him, leaving four ragged claw marks on his chest. Dr. Bright winced in pain and started running in the other direction. He reached an adjoining hallway and booked it for the armory, hoping there he'd get some serious firepower. But SCP-106 suddenly phased through the wall next to him, grabbing Dr. Bright by his lab coat and throwing him against the opposite wall with a flick of his wrist. Bright scrambled to discard the coat, already being eaten away by the old man's caustic fluids. The old man was just watching him and chuckled faintly, amused by the whole affair. These damn anomalies were in control now. Dr. Bright got up and kept running. The one saving grace was the fact that all of these anomalies were too sadistic to outright kill him just yet, so he still had the faintest of chances. He ran into the break room, tipping over shelves, bookcases, and furniture to obstruct the path behind him ever so slightly. That's when he heard the door behind him open, followed by a wave of furious German expletives as the immortal Hitler clone entered the room to give chase. However, moments later, Hitler fell to the ground, clutching his foot and wailing in agony. You see, due to the circumstances of his creation, Joseph Stalin, Sarkic Wizards, it was a whole thing, we really can't get into it now, he felt pain at three times the intensity of a normal human being. Lieber Gott, I'd stopped mein toe! He yelled. Dr. Bright kept running. From the break room, he entered the hallway that would lead him back to the main barracks. Perhaps there he could get some reinforcements, and maybe he could. His thoughts were once again cut off by Abel suddenly appearing and grabbing him by the throat. His grip was impossibly strong. Dr. Bright was already seeing stars. Think you could get away that easily? Abel hissed. With horrifying strength, Abel slammed Dr. Bright up against one of the shuttered windows. He struck it with such a force he broke through the shutter and the glass behind it, sailing down to the ground outside. They were lucky it was nighttime, or this all would have been over already. Abel soon followed him down, cracking his knuckles and assuming a fighting stance. Up on your feet, Jack, Abel said. I won't kill a man lying down. No honor in that. Jack rose, feeling pain in every inch of his body. Up against a seven-foot-tall jacked monster of a man with thousands of years of fighting under his belt, he stood mathematically zero chance. But perhaps he could at least get some licks in. He ran at Abel, screaming with years of pent-up rage, and tried to attack him with a flurry of blows. But not a single one landed. Abel was able to dodge every punch and returned them with a force comparable to being hit by a runaway train. He knocked Dr. Bright to the ground and started beating him relentlessly. All these lives I've given you, all this extra time and still, you haven't learned how to fight. Pathetic! Abel roared, punctuating his words with blows. Perhaps in a thousand years you might last 60 seconds against me. You are a waste of your gift. Dr. Bright could already feel the life leaving his body when something new entered the equation. He could barely make it out through his bloody, swollen eyes, but something huge was coming towards them. It was like flesh from so many of the melted people had coagulated into some huge mountainous blob. It was a sight so remarkable and horrifying that even Abel was distracted and Dr. Bright took advantage of the one chance that it gave him. He took off his medallion and threw it at the mass. The life left his old body as SCP-963 deleted the collection of tortured minds that had made up the terrible flesh monster and replaced them with only one, Dr. Jack Bright. He felt new, immense, monstrous strength well up through him. He was in the body of a true abomination, and all of its power was his now. How about a round two, Abel? He thought. The ancient warrior produced a pair of ebony swords as Dr. Bright sent a swarm of fleshy tendrils at him. Abel was quick, slicing off many of them, but there was only so much he could take. Soon Dr. Bright's new body was grabbing Abel's every appendage, holding him in place as he struggled with all his anomalous might. But now Dr. Bright's rage had meaning, with his new power to back it up. He'd get a little revenge at long last. Time to go back in the box, Abel. It took longer than it would for any mortal man, but eventually, it happened all the same. Bright pushed and pulled in every direction, applying every kind of pressure, leveraging every ounce of his terrible new mass onto Abel's body until... Crunch. 
Dr. Bright relaxed his new body in a final cathartic relief, dropping Abel's corpse to the ground. There was no denying after everything that happened that it felt really, really, really good. The world may have ended, but at least Dr. Bright got one win today. Now go check out Dr. Bright for President SCP-4444 Bush vs. Gore and SCP-963 What Would You Do If You Were Immortal Like Dr. Jack Bright for more strange battles and adventures from the amazing Dr. Bright.